there, but he wrote the uh, the story about Candide. Um, and actually, this is this is where this idea of the how 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 comes from. It's the how COVID stopped humans, how we measured it, and how it redefined in in in, uh, in not only in my mind, but I think in many people's mind. And I hope it will be still a landmark in the future of what we did uh, this time. So um, this this um, presentation is a mix of what we did, what how we did it, and, and who else does it. So it's not only us. So just uh, as a, a standard background, of course, you know that uh, um, more than a year ago it was made public that there was an outbreak of something in China. Then it was identified as a as a virus that was in, of the type of the coronaviruses, um, and it became more scary for people when it really the outbreak in Italy was declared and the first casualties were already counted, while the spread in Europe, and for example, in Belgium would be in February uh, for the first first cases, uh, but were really slowly getting attention. And it's only until mid-March that everyone really noticed that it was something wrong. Um, in mid-March, the 11th of March, uh, the um, director general of the WHO uh, stated that they have therefore made the assessment that the COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. That was the first time, I, as far as I remember, that I've seen a, a pandemic declared by the WHO. And they also said, he also said in, in his in his opening um, speech, that um, that it will not be a small health crisis. It's not. Um, it will touch every sector, and okay, a year after, we know that every sector has been has been affected, of course, and it requires a whole of a society approach and very strong measures to minimize the impact, to prevent infection and save lives. And in summarizing the way, uh, summarizing to do how to do that, it was, it looks simple on paper and we know now that it's not as simple. He said, you uh, co um, countries, governments need to be ready and prepare. They need to detect, protect and treat. They need to reduce transmission and innovate and learn. So what we noticed all, of course, since the beginning is all the failures of our dear governments, but we also can notice that there were efficient measures that minimized the impact on the um, health sector. For example, uh, protect the NHS was a very strong thing to, to, uh, to, um, to be shared in the UK, but also everywhere in, in the world. And so what, what does it look like? If you look at um, your colleagues from, from Oxford, they, they made maps of what they call a stringency index. And so to reduce transmissions, countries don't have many, many means. The most, the, the most important one they have is to prevent your individual li liberty, um, freedom to move. And although it's uh, uh, some strictness, some stringency to remove uh, freedom from people, this is the only way, the only efficient way until a, a proper um, antivirus um, uh, is, is, is available. And so this, this video shows you the, the spread of the stringency uh, being from uh, pale, pale yellow to dark blue, and dark blue would be like completely locked down country with no allowance, uh, no uh, authorizations to go out. Like you would, you would, you had already, if you see on this picture on the 21st of January, you already had a very strong stringency in some places of Italy. And while the zero to 30 would be something like uh, you have to wear a mask in public. And so, of course, this wave of decisions was also following hopefully not was ahead of the virus. We usually was following the virus. And so we we will see that this wave of measures also as a wave that we can measure in seismology. So what are these lockdown measures? Of course, they're, they're the hashtag stay home, save lives, save NHS, and all, the, all these elements, even Google made a, a GIF out of it. So poetically, we, we, we know that the streets were empty. Public transport was maintained because you need to have uh, the essential workers to go to work. And actually many, many of us, me included, discovered who these essential workers are. And so surprisingly, it's not only doctors and nurses. It's a lot of people that make the country run and, and work. So, um, of course, you have some edits to some very nice landmarks. Um, streets were completely empty and only the um, Essential people, essential workers would go to the office. It was quiet everywhere. Shops were closed. Um, even Piazza Navona was uh, was was empty um, in in in, uh, in Rome. Um, and so, what happens when we stop? Well, we do have a strong impact on the environment, but all scales, temporal and spatial, and from local to global effects, from the instant of a decision we take to the centuries of the or actions, um, when when human act, the environment reacts react in some way to, to what we, we, we impose to the planet. 
So seismologists don't, well, let's say didn't like noise, um, because it was known for, for the early ages of seismology that seismic noise al alters, noise alters the, the seismogram readings. And we talk about noise, we talk about whatever seismogram we pick, seismometer we pick. So scientists were always for this, in the search of the quietest environment for installing uh, equipment, for example, going to rural areas or going to um, uh, away from cities. Well, the problem was that that's very nice to say, but if you want to put a, a one ton sensor in a rural area and you have to change a, a smoked paper every 12 hours, that might not be super easy for seismologists to work with data. So in the end, the seismometers were still in the cities. So they tried to be buried in the ground or uh, a little bit away from the city, like in Brussels, for example, the seismometer was in a, in a green area outskirt of Brussels, which is now part of the city, of course, but at the time was away. But noise is everywhere also. So these continuous vibrations we measure with seismometers, they have all different kinds of origins. The oceans are responsible for a major part of the high uh, low frequency noise, while the, the high frequency has, has been thought to be um, and, and shown that it was uh, made, the humans were a major culprit for that. And so now, of course, uh, as Steve said, I'm working a lot with this ambient seismic wave field, let's call it to be a little, a little less negative about the term noise. Um, I'm, I'm using it because it's it's been thought beginning of the century, last century, uh, and it's been shown since uh, yeah year 2000s that we can actually extract a lot of coherent information, coherent wave field from this ambient seismic field wave field, and then so use this correlation of seismic noise, for example, for monitoring volcanoes or for imaging uh, the planet or uh, monitoring groundwater, for example. So it, how do we really know that we are we are responsible, we are culprits for the high frequency noise? Um, well, if you look at this uh, displace, displacement um, data, so this is the displacement of the ground recorded in, in Euclid in Brussels, and you see that, well, there's like, you know, weekends and weekdays and Christmas holidays. So it seems that during the night, the station is quiet. During the day, it is noisy. During the week, and it's more quiet than during the week. And during the Christmas holidays, the week cycle is broken because you have the New Year Eve, for example, that has this little peak here. So the New Year Eve night is actually a lot noisier than any other night of the year. So we kind of know that we are responsible for, for part of this noise. If we split that information and we, we aggregate it in a way that you, you, you imagine that you have a 24 hour uh, clock watch, and you're looking at the, the trace, each color of the trace is one day, and you see that these the, the brownish and the bluish color are actually the early Saturday morning or early Sunday morning, which we also call Friday night and Saturday night. And of course, they are more noisy until three o'clock in the morning in Brussels because party people are going back home and then also public transport is going, for, going further into the night and, and it's uh, with more frequency. So we know we know we are a part of the, uh, of the responsibility. We also know that seismologists are watching you. So this is an analysis. If you don't never read it, I encourage you to do. It's a paper from uh, Klaus Hinson, Sharon Riemer, and Klaus Reicher, colleagues from the um, the Bensberg Seismic Station in Cologne. And actually, they were they were robbed. And so uh, Klaus made an analysis of the the movement of the burglar in the house. Uh, so the house is hosting the seismic station, uh, the official seismic station from the Cologne University, and this is where the operations take part, uh, that take um, okay, um, happen. Um, and so he made a whole study of when the burglar was at the first floor, the second floor, went down and, and stole something, broke a window, and then went get, get out. So that was actually the first case I think the police of Cologne got uh, down to the millisecond timing of the movements of a burglar in a house. Uh, we also have very cool stuff that we measured. For example, that's what I, I measured in 2009 when the Prodigy came to Brussels. Uh, and then back in 2018, so that the top here you see three seismic recordings of seismic nodes we installed next to the to the concert hall, a kilometer away and two kilometers away. So to see the propagation of velocities of seismic waves and the attenuation of high frequency noise, we can do a lot of stuff with noise. Well, there's also creepy parts, and actually, uh, Steve, you will be surprised. We didn't know this paper before, but actually, it's an old one. Um, I found while preparing this talk. Um, it's it's a talk that was given by people at a conference on technologies for homeland security. So it's kind of creepy. So the first column is uh, footsteps vibration signatures from um, some, some regular soft and really stealthy footsteps on a grassy ground. 
you see that tribes, people trying to be discreet still were picked up by seismometer. They have the same analysis for, for dogs and they also have like acoustic uh, things, uh, Doppler measurements. And then they also have the, um, that's human uh, footsteps normally and that's uh, run, running by dogs. So we actually can measure a lot of things with, with seismic, seismic data. Uh, we pick up stuff that is of course very, very fine, but we also integrate over a large spatial area. And this is something that we also have to take into account. So when we pace down for the lockdowns, coming back to the the, uh, the pandemic, um, on on March 15 in Brussels, we were imposed to um, close the non-essential shops, and on the 18th, was the strictest measure was enforced. Uh, tele telework was uh, forced for people who could do it, so for works that were doable, like my job, and and for for some, including me. That was the first time home. So on the 20th, I was already a bit bored. I was like, okay, I need to to, to say first to show that we were ready in terms of IT and, and technology to work from home. Seismology can be done at home. Um, it's less fun, of course, but it's doable. And I wanted also to share this 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 tweet on the left what, to show that um, although we, it, we feel very alone, um, we all together are making something big. We feel alone home. We feel that we are the only ones respecting the rules. But in the end, I wanted to show that because we see it in the seismic data means that there's a lot of people following these rules, following these these, these measures. And I think this was a, a really a, first it was for the colleagues, for my families. But then, of course, it went a little bit further. Uh, actually, it called. Yeah, it's maybe a bad joke, but it went viral um, when Gizmodo shared the story uh, that we saw. We saw that here in Brussels that he was like that, and Steve was already uh, busy doing plots for for the whole of UK, and um, Jordi was doing stuff for Barcelona, and then we had a lot of people working already and sharing information, sharing this this knowledge on Twitter and and, and results, and and that uh, who has the the biggest uh, drop in velocity in, in in noise and so on and so forth. So. Uh, it took us a little bit of time to sort all the media requests. The good thing with Twitter is that we already knew who was busy with doing the same stuff. So we could, I could, for example, every time I had a, a call, I could uh, link it to someone who who, um, who is local. So if I get a call for how oh, was the situation in Italy, but I would just transfer the information to Italian colleagues so that I don't have first to take to, to do it, and also because it's always nicer for to having a local story for these news newspapers. What also happened is that um, because, as Steve said, that uh, open source is probably my only language, um, I decided that immediately we need to share the, the code so that it was an easy way to process data. Uh, we are very lucky in seismology to be probably the, the best, I think, uh, community for sharing data for the, the longest time. Um, we've been since the beginning of seismology, we would send out copies of, of uh, seismographs, seismograms all over the world, even before the, the internet was there. Um, so sharing data and sharing knowledge in seismology has always been there. Data and metadata are accessible and standardized. And then why not code? So the code was put on Twitter, uh, on GitHub, sorry, and shared on Twitter. Frédéric Massin made an adaptation uh, with Mark Van Stone to be able to read the Raspberry Shakes and everything went really wild. Uh, everyone was was do, doing their own plots, their own graphs. You see Mark Van Stone, for those of you who don't know him yet, is a teacher in the Sugar and the School, and he made posters of the noise drop in his neighborhood with all the different plots we were putting. And every time there was a new type of plot, he would add it to, the, to, his, to his feed so that people would learn. So it's also a tool for learning. Um, and then I, I had this crazy idea. Uh, it turned out to work pretty well. I was, I was, I'm still surprised today how well it uh, it, it went. Um, first of April, again, that's not a bad joke. I'm, I'm, I'm very good at uh, timing, I think. Uh, and I said, yeah, why not? Why? I mean, we were we were seeing many many people um, using uh, or code or or um, their own, but doing doing. Um, doing processing of seismic data. And I said, why why don't we share this this uh, effort all together uh, and try to make a publication out of it, so to make to make something out of it so that we have a, a common task and something like um, the idea was already in the beginning to um, I mean, to uh, to occupy my brain with something else than numbers from casualties and, and cases. Um, so, yeah, we gathered 101 people on Slack. And so I think this is the for most of us, and Steve will not contradict me, that was probably the strictest isolation I've never, I've ever known. But that was the the most connected time of my life. I 
I, I, I had no trouble ever to wake up in the morning at six behind my computer and until midnight or one o'clock in the morning reply because that was the time that the New Zealanders were connected and we could, we could chat and, and decide what to do with the data and with the paper. And so in the end, this community was 100 people and we exchanged, you see, on, on, the, on the Slack channel, 13,000 messages in a few months. I was really uh, mind blowing and we learned it's not only a chat, it's just that we did something together. What we did was to analyze more than 300 seismic stations worldwide, taking professional seismic stations from, from uh, official observatory networks, but also taking Raspberry uh, uh, citizen seismometers, Raspberry Shake seismometers, because what we also wanted was to show the effect of lockdowns and professional seismometers are usually a little bit away from cities, while the Raspberry citizen seismometer are at home at people's place. And so we tested a lot of stuff. And in the end, this, this map shows you where in red the lockdown were seen in, in, uh, on the data at high frequency. So we're talking about 4 to 20 hertz uh, seismic noise. That was uh, a band that was common to all but one station in Finland where this, this band didn't work and they used a much higher frequency. Um, but then generally speaking, this reasonably high frequency noise was, was dropping in many, many places in the world. And with some cases, like you see, for example, uh, in, in um, Mediterranean or in the Azor or in the central US or North Canada, there was there were cases where you have less effect. But you also have um, places where you have this, you this big big red square means that's a very low population density, so it's inversely proportional to the density of population. And you see that here, a uh, very low density of population, but still the drop was visible on the data. And what does it mean it was visible? So if you take this ground motion I showed you for, for Brussels, uh, we, do, we don't want to com we didn't want to compare numbers because we don't want to to show uh, mil nanometers millimeters it's, it doesn't speak what we wanted to show is the difference from before so what is before well that's the Sunday night to the let's say Wednesday midday that would be your normal range and that would be zero to hundred percent or plus or minus fifty percent and from there we can uh, normalize all the data and obtain this figure which shows you the analysis of the 268 stations. Um, each line corresponds to the amplitude, so it's color-coded of normalized amplitude, um, and each line corresponds to a city or a place um, in the world. The uh, start of lockdowns is imaged by these little white dots here, and so these, sta these uh, stations, these cities are sorted by the start of the lockdowns. And you see that you can see the wave of lockdown enforcement and the wave of seismic noise drop being blue darker colors is lower amplitude and you see of course that many pay countries in the world still have um, uh, drops during Christmas holidays but for example not this line here and this line here is in Switzerland it's a ski resort area so during Christmas it's almost as busy as the rest of the of the of the um, of the country of the rest of the year while at, at many places uh, of course Christmas Day is, is much more quiet. So this was really mind-blowing to see that we could see these changes and in the end we don't compare nanometers we're comparing percentage and they kind of match most of them uh, in, in a sense that we are between probably um, 20 to, to 50 percent drop of, of energy of seismic noise. So if we take this, this the median of, of all, um, this is the white line you see here. So you see you, you oscillate between around the zero and plus minus 50% or something similar. Um, so Christmas Day and New Year, of course, are very quiet day usually. People tend to be uh, moved before and after, but not during these days. And and uh, globally in the night is is is, uh, is still quite quiet. Then uh, you see that the normal year was was going, and then boom, it drops. The other the other lines here in color are the real big brothers. That's Apple, Google, uh, and others that track your cell phone and and say if you are doing residential, if you're doing shopping, if you're doing transport. And you see that all the categories of these mobility indexes were going down. Uh, except one called the residential. Of course, it's anti-correlated, so they, they also know that you stayed home more. If we look at different what we, we, we try to do, um, so sort of this, this first panel was an idea, for example, from Steve, was to look at the, um, the lockdown effects on seismic noise com 
compared to the other years? Because you might not know that in China, they actually took advantage of the Chinese New Year to uh, to uh, enforce the lockdown uh, measures, the stay home measures. Um, but what changed that it actually um, had a much longer duration than the normal holidays of the Christmas of the uh, Chinese New Year. So you see that normal years you have a drop of like a few days and maybe 10 days or two weeks. But then, of course, it was two months in the case of the uh, COVID-19 uh, lockdown measures. And you see here, for example, normally the activity before uh, Chinese New Year are, are reasonably low, then it drop, then they go back full force. It's kind of a thing that we see also for this third station. But then during the pandemic, it was progressive uh, going back to normal, but it was depending on the region. In China, of course, it's a different case. We did different stories, different analyses, comparing, for example, in Brussels, the seismic noise and the audible noise. In, in Barbados, we compared it with the number of flights who, who, uh, which uh, landed in the airport. Um, all this to suggest that there is, and we are very aware of it, there is a big mix of different sources, of different origins of this noise. It is in that frequency band everything we're measuring everything there was a peak in brussels at some point and that peak was linked to a single beko that was that was uh, demolishing a house at 200 meters from the station it was nothing to do with with noise in, induced by uh, traffic or by by people um yeah this is just this is just a showcase because i find these graphs are really cool you have here the uh, ski resorts uh, ski resort areas, and you see that uh, Christmas New Year is a normal period for them, even even more more energyful. And then, of course, it drops really dramatically when all the infrastructure is stopped, because you know that says that uh, big infrastructure for ski resorts is generating a lot of vibrations just by the the big uh, uh, equipment they they have to to bring people up in the mountains. Um, so this this makes a, a, a big difference. And in, in, if you look, for example, for the Mammoth Mountain case, you see what what the uh, energy of a 5.2 event uh, would look like. And if you compare it, the signal to noise ratio during this lockdown or before, of course, you will not have the same story. So this is also something that people are working on and different groups are working on now. And as there's publications coming on that, is that can we can we learn something new from the, the, the earth hum being, being lower in high frequencies? Can we learn from, can we hear earthquakes better? Can we hear more earthquakes? And, and these are elements that people want to to know to know uh, to know more this is an example again from um michigan uh that's a, that's a raspberry shade that's very famous for recording uh football matches uh american football so in the end yeah, we ended up with that thing uh, i still can't believe we made it um and uh, i finally should put my hands on the real paper for the first time of my life i i ordered uh um the magazine just to have it i mean I probably will never make a second science and certainly probably not a, a 76 author science paper soon. So I wanted to have it and it's at the at the post. Now I have to get it, get it. Um, we analyzed six months of data for 337 stations. And all these people did their share of the analysis. So the magic was we used one code. Everyone processed the data and we gathered the uh, the, the processed data and not the original data. Uh, the raw data was 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 at people's place, not us. And then we joined forces to um, to write this paper. Uh, oh, most of the tools we're using, so Python was the code, uh, the Slack community, Overleaf for writing, and Google Docs for interactive reviews. And I can tell you that interactive reviews with 76 authors is uh, probably one of the most uh, fantastic thing I've seen in my life. I remember with Steve and Kuhn, we were looking at the Google Doc filling in with people putting, putting information about each line that they want to change or think. Um, and other stuff. And because I say that it is, it's, a, it's a talk about the how, you might wonder how you manage to have uh, 76 authors and 66 affiliations sorted. So um, I'm ready to share you with this code also. So we, we opened a Google uh, sheet where people would input their name and their affiliation one and affiliation two. And then um, we would fix the, the first uh, eight authors because that's the we, we contributed most to the, to the writing and then sort all the other authors by, uh, for, uh, by last name. So this is what happens here on the left. And then some magic of Python and Pandas would generate a co the, the either the LaTeX or the Word document sorted affiliation list uh, that uh, we needed to put together. And I, I can tell you that 
um, if, if someone, and it happens, someone just inverts two affiliations, it changes the order of all the numbers. So you don't want to do that manually. Even for five authors, I think I will definitely do that again. So I will share that code too. And that's, that's so that's Google Google Sheets and um, attacked by uh, Pandas via the Google, Google Sheets API. It was really cool. Anyway, a small aparte. Uh, what we also did, uh, because uh, Stephen Kuhn had this very fantastic idea that uh, it's true, we never celebrate papers enough. We are not proud enough of what we did. And certainly for this one, uh, they, they made me this surprise. Uh, and we are a team now in the, across the whole world who have this shirt. Uh, and I can tell you that I'm very proud to, uh, to wear it every time and often when I, when I go here cycling uh, or running around uh, the neighborhood of Brussels here. Uh, so the Team 76 is a thing. Uh, and you can join us on Strava if you want to, uh, to be part of the family. You're most welcome. Um, so what else? What else can you do? Um, there's numerous studies now that, that focus on different regions, so China, Italy, USA, Japan, Brazil, name it. Um, the use of, of dark fibers, fiber optics, to, to really monitor cars and pedestrians, there's also this, this kind of scary thing I showed you in the beginning that you can do with dark fibers. You can really say if someone is walking on running or whatever, or trying to walk stealthily. Um, we have a period and hopefully, as I said in the abstract, hopefully will be the only one we will ever know when the whole world was synchronously low in high frequency noise. And many of the, those countries went into these lockdown me enforced measures uh, in, a, in a very rapid manner. From, from day one to day two, there was a sharp, very sharp decrease of noise. And then we were progressively allowed to redo stuff. So this, this um, deconfinement is probably a very good period to study what are the contributions to this mix we're measuring. What, what is it, for example, in Brussels, I mean, they, they, we, we could go to the office once a week. So that's, let's say, one fifth of the normal traffic. How does that change the, the seismic noise level? Um, you, you don't have uh, planes in Brussels. May, may, there's many, very few planes. How does that affect seismic noise? So we can now try to decipher the content of this noise. Um, there's also, I think, one message that we convey and we still want to share is that seismic and seismic noise are, are a fantastic tool to, for education. Um, raspberry shake seismometers are cheap. You have other stuff that could be could be done too. On the left here, you have a, a, a whole dashboard made by a, a nine, nine grader, a 14 year old kid in, in Calgary. Um, and he's, he is running um, a, a whole detector of seismic noise amplitudes. And he's and if you see if you see here on the, on the left, that's a, a robot he built to uh, to measure and, and visualize cars in his street. Uh, just based on seismic noise plus that, he can say that if it's a car, if it's a tram that passes in front of his house, well, that, this is really brilliant. I encourage you to read it. So we monitor my uh, But also, for example, in, in, in Australia, you have the seismometers at school. They, they use the code we, pro we produced and they put it in, a, in an automatic scheduled fashion and it would trigger a, uh, the creation of, of automatic pages. Um, also, um, Shiba here is, is running a, a GoFundMe to uh, enhance the seismic network of Raspberry Shakes. He's, he's put together in Nepal, and, and it's already a very successful project. And, and so we, we encourage kids, students to learn from the seismic noise, but also this is a long-term education because these, these young people will be the adults of tomorrow, and they will know that in their city, in their, in their country, there are earthquakes, and they are measurable, and they can do something about it. Um, in Brussels, we are trying to understand where the noise comes from. So we, we've set up an array and some microphones trying to do uh, some, some beam forming with the, with the end seismic energy and then from with the wind and, and the energy of the microphone trying to understand where it comes from. But that's uh, a story for later when I have some time. What if, what if you want to do it yourself? Well, you can use the code. It's on, on GitHub and the slides here will be shared. Uh, so I, I count on Steve to share it with, with you all. Or you can use and take part to MS Noise 2, which is the next version of where the, you know, the things to do when I have some time thing. Um, it will be including all the uh, nice graphics that you can do. It was originally something to compute velocity variations specifically for volcanoes. But now it's, it, the idea also is to bring these easy tools for a wider community and for example for students they would they can use it as a black box in the beginning just to have a, a wow effect of what they're looking at what they what their sensor looks like um, so i want to stop here and say that um, again repeat and and we insisted uh, with steve and the others to put this sentence at the top there in the paper we were very lucky and we still are um, 
I'm home. I have my full salary. I can do my job and my passion. I can share it. Um, well, then let me let me share it. Let me do it. So share knowledge, and and I think this is an important thing. And to the very end, on the on the bottom right, this is our new 2020 um, keep me, keep me busy <laughs> project. Um, we are fed up with uh, very very expensive open access, and it's time. 2021, it's time to um, to learn from Big Brother, Big Sister, We Are Volcanica, uh, and start We Are Seismica. Thank you for your attention. I'm I'm, I'm available for your questions uh, now or later by email or whatever, whenever or Twitter, wherever you want. Thanks. Cool. Thank you, Thomas. That was a uh, uh, really really nice talk. Great summary. Um, yeah, covered covered lots of aspects, interest in science, um, different ways of doing science, um, and sort of applicable to to you know uh, events that have uh, impacted us all in some way. So yeah, if you could, if anyone could type their their questions into the chat, that would be um, super, please. Any any questions at all um, from any sort of context, any background, no matter how simple or complicated, it'd be great to hear from you. Um, I don't think we've got anything in yet, so I will get the ball rolling um to to ask uh something how has the so we've had more more lockdowns in um uh at the end of last year and going into this year how has the noise level changed the seismic noise level i guess in the uk we've seen you know we've had strict lockdowns but we're still seeing you know a lot of cars on the road and, and things like this so how has how has it been compared to spring last year uh, I think I, I mean for the one the one key, the case that I know it never went as low as uh, end of March beginning of April never even when we are uh, here for example in Brussels in in November we were in a strict lockdown it wasn't as strict I mean we could we people already forget that in 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 end of March we could not go further than one kilometer around our houses. Uh, this restricts quite a lot the mobility, and this was the most efficient uh, in terms of seismic noise uh, reduction. Um, not talking about the efficiency of, me of lockdown measures, that's not my job. And I don't want to talk about it, I, actually. Uh, it's not, um, I mean, people try to, to link those together. It's, it's difficult because uh, you have also cases, and we show it in the, in, in the paper, that, uh, for example, in Japan, there is a drop of seismic noise, although there was no, there were no official lockdown measures enforced. Uh, so it's it's maybe sometimes also up to the community to take their share of doing the right thing, while we, without really waiting for a, an order from a government, if possible, of course. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, thanks for that. We have a question from Jenny Collier, and um, he says many thanks for your talk, Thomas. And um, do you think there will be any changes in sort of how we cite our current permanent seismometer installations based on, on what you found or you know how that might change for how we think about where we want to install seismometers in the future? I think one thing, I mean, we live in a, in a, in a, in a fantastic epoch now that um, internet is basically available everywhere, based almost everywhere. And so we could, we can really, really invest into going really into the wild. I mean, looking really, really in, in, in far away in the, in the forests, in the mountains. I don't know. Um, stay away from the grid. Uh, and, and we have tools now and, and we are thinking of, of, uh, yeah, and we need to talk about it, Steve, by the way. Uh, we have tools for looking at stations and then drawing a circle on, on, on QGIS. QGIS and and counting the number of streets around, counting the number of houses around, and and, and finding proxies. I think um, there is a there is a work that's been done by um, Emily Wallen in, in the USGS uh, with with her colleagues, and they're looking at the performance uh, of of their uh, may, uh, normal network um, permanent network seismic stations to see if uh, they were well installed or not. And I think this also kind of there will be there will be lessons learned from that. Uh, the the stations that have shown the le the least changes are probably the ones that that of course are either well built or far away from from whatever. But uh, there are cases where you cannot do much more than what you do. For example, New Zealand uh, in Auckland, we have this seismometer at 300 meters below the city of Auckland. It is better than the surface one. But you still want to have it there because that's where you want to monitor the seismic activity of the old Kalan volcanic field, for example. So um, there's always a, yeah, it's a mix between what you need and what you could do. But certainly installing seismometers in in more remote places as possible, um, and and maybe less but better seismometers too. 
Great, thank you. Um, any other questions? I guess um, following on from uh, since Jenny asked the question, so Jenny's a, a marine geophysicist, and we did, or, or some some people on the in the authorship list did look for sort of was there any change in noise in hydrophones and marine mm -hmm. based seismic data? I don't know if you can. I don't think we saw too much, but I don't know if you can add anything. No, we didn't. Uh, what we didn't do yet is to look at all the uh, the CTBT stations that could have been a, 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 a good thing to test. Um, but there are cases where I think this there's two two teams in Canada have shown that you have a drop of, uh, let's say, audible noise, so hydrophone noise in the ocean, and they could link it to the appearance of different um, mammals in, in the Saint Laurent area and then uh, offshore of, of Canada too. I think this is, um, if they see it in the water, we should see it in the, at the ocean bottom. For sure, there was there were much less ships. That's the reason why they have less noise in the ocean. Um, but also in terms of general vibration of the earth, of course, there was a um, it was visible. What we saw uh, in in uh, when we looked at the European OBSs, there was not so many at the time, uh, was that the North Atlantic Ocean was beautifully calm between March and June, uh, which is also why I could go and run every every now and then here to keep my my brain a bit fresh. Um, it was nice weather. I mean, we had very very nice lockdown here in Brussels, for example, was blue sky and, and sunny every day. Um, but the the uh, OBSs in in um, in Canada, uh, uh, the ones at least that have a, an hydrophone have ever signature for that, yes. Great, thank you. We um, have another question from uh, Tina uh, Van Die Flett, uh, who has absolutely fascinating uh, talk. Thank you. Um, can you say a few more words on how you sort of found all your co-authors to make uh, this such a global effort? So it started by this crazy tweet, uh, which attracted a lot of, of attention. Then the first people would reach Slack and we would tell them, OK, please invite whoever you want to, to invite. And I, was, I also know a bunch of people who are not tweeters. Uh, and so uh, we emailed a lot also. Um, and this, this is definitely something we need to, to work on. And, and for example, within the Seismic, Seismica initiative, we are already uh, discussing with, with Steve and others how, how we can um, include more people, include more communities, include more continents, um, because it's it's quite sure if you look at the 76 authors, um, we are we are lacking some some areas, some some expertise, some some um, yeah some people. Um, this is not fully fully inclusive because yeah it started by on Twitter it went very fast in the beginning so the ones joining a bit later were finding sometimes a bit difficult to keep up. Um, so we try to stay as inclusive and as as uh, as possible. Of course, it's it's it was it was also a race because we didn't expect to, it to go too so fast. So we decided to launch the community on the first of April, and the uh, and the manuscript was accepted on the on the um, uh, was submitted on the tenth of June. So and and, and published online and 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 July. Uh, I mean, I was. Uh, we we were at uh, 100,000 uh, RPM all the time, so it was a bit like a, a bit hard. But I think I think we need also to find out um, what what and how we can also in terms of the community or how, how to to link with these initiatives that that really try to have more to be more inclusive and and um, also for example for uh, what they call the the emergent countries or the south. The global south. Uh, there's, there's, there's certainly work for on that. Uh, in, in the way we, not only on the way we, we try to attract people to work with us, but also the way we share information and we share knowledge with them. Um, I mean, I've, I've been teaching MS Noise in, in workshops for ten years now, um, and every time you go, um, for example, I gave workshop in Indonesia, or we did, we, we did it in, in Japan also. There's there's a lot of interest, but there's very few knowledge that these tools might exist or might be open and, and available. So this is also kind of things I think we need to do as as a community to really share and support uh, the, these uh, by sharing data or by sharing code is the first. I, this, this is what I do best. I'm not I'm not a very strong the theorician, but I, I love to share that. And I think this is a, a way also to attract more people. Yeah, and I guess just to follow on from that, because we've you know had more studies sort of uh, uh, published and being submitted since on this particular subject, but sort of more maybe regional focus or specific focuses of the noise reduction or the, the impact of the noise reduction. It's been nice to at least sort of spur on. So we've had yeah submissions from different areas of the world, like Brazil, for example. And I don't think we had any people 
from Brazil, Brazil in our initial community, but at least there has been some people, some groups who have sort of taken taken on what we started and, and, and produced their own nice scientific studies out of it too. Yeah, what, what, what may, your, your colleagues might not know is that with Steve and others, we started, uh, we, we coordinated with the EGU to call for a special issue on that subject. So we, we considered our, our paper like a bit like the patient zero, uh, the trigger, and then, uh, and then many, many people who were not at the same pace or were not with us at that time, we cannot have everyone, uh, would do their, their own study and, and, and specific ac axes of research or thematics. And, and we, we welcomed those, those articles. So I think we have nine or 10 now in the, in the special issue, uh, which is a, a good success because it's, uh, that's, those kind of studies would be difficult to publish without having this special issue. Although there is now numerous in SRL, for example, or, or, or elsewhere, I think this is, uh, this is doable. Super, thank you. Um, we'll give it one more minute if anyone wants to type any questions or if, you, if you're typing a long question, just say or put your hand up to say you're typing something. Um, otherwise, I'm amazed we've kept to the time schedule um, given the, uh, the dodgy technical problems at the start. So apologies to everyone for, for that, but it was great that I think everyone was able to make it across. Um, we'll give it a little bit longer. <laughs> Any questions at all would be greatly appreciated, but if not, um, I guess we'll leave it there. So thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you. Pleasure. For, thank you for visiting. Um, <laughs> I wish, I wish, I'm, I'm dreaming of the moment where we'll be officially deconfined, japped and everything so we can, uh, I can go around the world or you can come here and we can really have a, this finally a beer together properly. So, or a tea, whatever. Yeah. I don't know if anyone, any of the departmental organizers want to mention next week's seminar or anything like that. I will leave, leave you to come in. No? Okay.